Okay, everyone, so this is your weekly show where we talk about all things music teaching. If we haven't met before, my name's Nicola Canton and we come here to connect with community. I'm a piano teacher in Dublin, in Ireland, and I run a couple of websites, Vibrant Music Teaching, Vivid Practice and Colourful Keys. I know a couple means two, but that's three. <laughs> I can count. But I really enjoy just talking about music teaching, talking shop, connecting with other music teachers and having fun and connecting with you wherever you are, whether you're watching on YouTube live now or Facebook or Instagram. Hello. Let me know what's going on with you and what's going on in your studio. A frosty day over in Scotland. Rainy days in many parts of the world. Flooding in Southern California. Oh my gosh. Sorry to hear that. We've nothing so serious over here. Um, just annoying rain, not destructive rain. <laughs> so that's good, fingers crossed. Um, but yeah, it's February, right? February is a bit of a mess weather-wise in many parts of the world. So hopefully we can brave it out together. Now today we're talking about students with injured arms or hands and what we can do with them during lessons. So let me know if you have your ideas for getting going with lessons, keeping lessons going, having fun in lessons, even when your student has injured one of their hands or arms or collarbones or anything that makes them one-sided <laughs> for a little while. A few things I want to let you know about before we get there. So first of all, next week is the practice symposium. Oh my gosh, if you haven't registered yet, you have to do it. It is so good. It's at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash PS. That's the link. Vibrantmusicteaching.com slash PS is where you can sign up. And we have some fantastic stuff lined up. I have the privilege of getting the guest sessions for these kinds of events ahead of time and getting to see them and I form questions based on that for the workbook and stuff like that. So that's why I watch them ahead of time. And they're so good. We are going to make practice so much better next week. Oh my gosh, I'm so looking forward to it. I've also been recording some of my parts. I'm there live during this, but I record some of the bits so that everything runs really smoothly and so that I can engage with the text chat as well during some of the parts. So um, it's all just putting in the preparation ahead of time so that everything runs smoothly for you. So if you haven't signed up yet, please do sign up because it is going to be so much fun. Number one, but you know, we always have fun. But number two, it's going to make such a difference to your students practice. If you follow even a few of the ideas from the three days, it's going to make such an impact. And that is the number one thing that I hear from teachers. We get emails from teachers about their major frustrations, right? And obviously the number one frustration that comes back is lack of practice. And it doesn't have to be as frustrating. There's so many different ways to look at it. So that's what we're exploring next week in the practice symp symposium. Um, we also have a member challenge going on at the moment. So if you're watching this and you're a Vibrant Music Teaching member, check out Film Yourself February. I'm challenging you to post a video of your teaching to record yourself and watch yourself. Yes, it's not an easy challenge, but it is 1000% worth it. So definitely check that out. And there will be a prize at the end for one lucky teacher who has posted their video of their teaching. So definitely worth taking the plunge and diving in and recording yourself. If you haven't done it before, if you've done it before and it's been a while, it's so worthwhile. And then finally, I want to remind you that MTNA is coming up in March. So this is the Music Teachers National Association Conference, national meaning national of the US. And it is in Atlanta this year, Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm flying over for it and we have a vibrant music booth. It's going to be Gigi from our team is going to be running the booth and I'll be around and I have several presentations as well. Um, three presentations. <laughs> and 
I'm just looking forward to meeting all of you. I'm so looking forward to meeting anyone that's going. So make sure that you've got your ticket if you're planning to go. If you live in or around Atlanta, apparently you can get a free ticket to just the exhibit hall. So you can still come say hello, even if you can't swing the registration fee or you just can't make yourself available for all the days, like if you're teaching or something. Maybe you could come by just in the morning one of the days and come to the um, exhibit hall and say hi. That would be amazing. I'd love to chat to you there. And yeah, I can't wait. I know not everyone can go to big conferences like this. I know they're expensive, but I've always found them to be so worth it. I absolutely love it. One of my favorite things to do is go to these big piano teacher, music teacher conferences. So yeah, hopefully we'll see you there as well. Question from Cindy about the symposium. The practice symposium, there's replays of the main live. So each day there are two hours of like live sessions where we have guest sessions and sessions from me and then bits in between where we talk about it. All of that is recorded and you can watch the replay for up to a year if you if you purchase a ticket. The part that is not recorded is the Zoom call at the end of the day. So you do have to be there live to participate in that because that's just discussions between the people attending and it's in breakout rooms, so we can't record it. So first two hours, the main sessions and the content is recorded and you can watch it on replay. But it's more fun if you can come to part of it live, if at all possible. Oh my gosh, that's amazing, Serena. That's so cool doing my second piano fundraiser for the Brittle Bone Society on 13th of February. That's so cool. Fantastic. Okay, let's dive in and talk about our students who are temporarily one-handed or one-armed. What can we do? So if your student has injured their right hand or their left hand or their right wrist or their left wrist or their elbow or their shoulder or their collarbone. Has anyone had that one? It's particularly common with GAA, which is Irish football and rugby is what I found. I know my brother played rugby and he, did he injure his collarbone twice? I think it was twice. <laughs> Could have been three times. And I had several students who injured their collarbone in GAA multiple times as well. So it does happen. But let me know what injuries you've seen in your studio. Another common one that comes up is trampolines. I actually have a student right now who's really, really hurt himself, his leg actually this time, um, in a trampolining incident. So it's not uncommon, despite all the safety stuff they have in place these days. So yeah, let me know what injuries you've seen. I'm gonna give you a few ideas. The first one is the most obvious. And several people have mentioned this in the chat already. And that is one-handed music, <laughs> right? So you can find several books out there that are for one hand alone. Obviously a lot of beginner repertoire is actually for one hand alone. So you can go there and perhaps do duet versions of that. But there's also some pieces um, on pianopronto.com. So I think the original book that Jennifer Eklund did, I think was Stage Left. I think that was the first one she did. And since then she's published several. So there's a lot of options on that site for pieces for one hand only. And obviously even if it's for left hand, you can play it with just the right hand. It's one handed, so that's the main point. So. Yeah, there's lots of options out there now for one handed music, but that's not all you can do. And I think if you only do that, I think it can be really tough to keep things interesting. Just as with really any student injured or not, if they have only one type of repertoire, a couple of pieces, and that's all you do for the lesson, it's going to be pretty dull. And I think when our students have injured a hand or whatever they've injured. A lot of other things in their life kind of get a bit dull. Let me know, by the way, if you ever injured a hand or an arm or something like that. And if you remember what it was like for you as a kid, like what was that experience like? I didn't injure, I didn't have any major injuries as really a kid, only as a teenager. 
I broke one of my fingers. Not a huge deal. I wasn't out of commission for that long, just a little while. Um, funny story, side note, it actually straightened my fingers. So I'm hypermobile and my fingers are really weirdly shaped. And <laughs> my straighter baby finger is the one that I broke because <laughs> it corrected it. <laughs> Very funny. Anyway, that's the only major like hand arm injury that I remember having had burns and things but nothing that would have stopped me playing in that way but yeah let me know what you've had I think when that happens a lot of the time life can become a bit boring okay so I think we want to make sure that our lessons are interesting and fun and stay lively right so one how music is great but let's not rely on it for all of what we do because I think then we're really cutting ourselves off. Ashley said I had a clarinet student who had a hand injury and they asked to continue with theory and we used one handed one hand piano to help this. Yeah they were well motivated so maybe you have a student who's learning a different instrument but you use this as an opportunity to learn a bit about the piano because not to be a piano centric person but it does make theory a lot easier because you can see it. Learning theory from a guitar standpoint or from any other instrument, violin, whatever, it's actually harder to teach some of these things, again, in my very biased opinion, having only taught piano. But I think referring to the piano could be useful. So learning some basics about piano is helpful. Also, if a student is going to go on to study music at college level or beyond, they often will be required to take some piano as part of that. So maybe explore a bit of piano, um, but some other ideas. So some of these are predictable if you know me well. The first one is improvisation. So this is a great chance to do lots more improvisation. When you're starting improv with a student or even, you know, well into various experiences with improv, the best way for them to experience is it is for you to accompany them so you play a simple chord pattern or repeating pattern of some sort and they improvise over the top and I actually don't want students to use two hands for that pretty much exclusively especially at the beginner to early intermediate level because they will normally jump around too much if they use two hands and that's not what sounds as musical as you know steps and skips with a few larger jumps which is what using one hand encourages them to do so definitely lots of improvisation is something i'd recommend for your students when they hurt one of their hands you can also use the extra time to do some extra games a lot of you tell me you run out of time to play music theory games right and i give a lot of different tips about fitting those in but if you do find yourself running out of time, especially if you have shorter lessons, I know several teachers, especially in the UK has been my experience anyway, that teach in schools that only get 20 minute lessons because that's what the school lets them pull the student out of lessons for, out of class for, they get 20 minutes. So fitting in games <laughs> during a 20 minute lesson is tough and you can probably only do the really quick ones. But when they injured one of their hands, Maybe you have time for slightly longer games or a couple of games in a lesson rather than just one. And you can really beef up their theory that way. Or maybe one of the things you take time to do during this period with them is more arranging of music. You could arrange folk songs. We have a course inside Vibrant Music Teaching um, called Arrange Again Repeat that helps you to take folk songs or any song, but folk songs are the example ones, and arrange it in different ways with students. So you could explore that. You could also take any lead sheet or chord chart and have them do some arranging with that. You could also have your student compose. We have loads of composing projects inside the Vibrant Music Teaching Library, and they're so much fun to do. And again, it's one of those things you might not normally find time to do because it takes a long time. <laughs> so we're starting our composing project right now and we have a new, new teacher this year 
who hasn't like this is their first year with us meaning they haven't done done a composing project with us before so there were a lot of warnings in our teacher meeting this week like it's gonna take longer than you think it will because it does especially if you're getting students to notate things themselves now we do if, if a student is particularly slow at notating whether it's because they're younger or they're just slower at writing we will do some of it for them, but I like them to do at least a bit themselves because they can learn so much from notating their own music. However, that takes time. Now, one of the ways we get around this or make the best use of our time is we do that composing during the buddy time of our buddy lessons. So two students can be writing stuff down and we're kind of helping both of them. That's perfectly possible for us to manage to do. And yeah, but if you're in solo lessons exclusively all the time, I know it is hard to find the time to compose. We have many composing projects for that reason. But if you want to go a bit deeper and do a bigger composing project, now is a great time to do it. Now that your student only has one hand. If their hand is that they can use is their non-dominant hand, maybe you need to do a bit more of the notation because uh, it might be frustrating for them if they're having to write with their left hand and they're right-handed. Um, but definitely worthwhile doing, for sure. The co composing project we're doing, by the way, this year is not out yet in the Vibrant Music Teaching Library. It will be once it's fully proofread and I once I've uh, recorded my video walkthrough of it, because I like to do that now to talk teachers through how to use it and tips and things like that. So I will be recording that and we'll get it double, triple checked and then we'll be uploading it. It's really fun though. What we're doing this year is um, we're writing dances as in like waltzes, sambas, etc. So we're writing mini ones and then we're going to take one of the mini ones and expand it to a full one page piece. Um, so. It's another different approach. We've loads of different projects in the library, though, to, for you to choose from. So, yeah, composing is a great way to use that time and they'll learn so much theory from that. You could also literally do some theory. <laughs> so not the whole lesson, like don't let their lesson become super boring just because they have injured one hand. No offense to theory workbook creators, because I am one. But doing a whole lesson of that is boring. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> as fun as a workbook can be, it shouldn't be a half an hour straight workbook. However, we all know some students don't do their theory work at home. Many of mine do, but some of them don't get around to it. I'd say especially the ones who, well, the ones who don't practice in general, or especially some of my neurodivergent students who really just need someone there to help them see it through. And so if we have that extra time, that's when we can do a little bit more of our theory workbook as well. How about more duets? Do you get time to play with your students often enough? Many of us don't. And it's one of the best things you can do for their rhythm, for their overall reading skills. So maybe you take out some duets, especially beginner books where they can learn it quite quickly and it's just one line and play through those. I often challenge my students who are a little bit further ahead. Like a student of mine last year, she injured her wrist of her left, left hand or right hand, I can't remember now. Anyway, she had started learning a duet already um, that her and her buddy were gonna play at our concert at the end of the year. And this was a couple of months before that she had this injury. So I had her play her duet part with just one hand because it was actually a melody between two hands so her buddy is a little bit less experienced than her so their duet book is like a tiny bit challenging for the less experienced buddy and then relatively easy for this student so i was like hey you could figure out how to play this with one hand let's do that we had to cut out one or two notes but it worked out great and she actually wasn't, her wrist was almost improved by the time we had the concert, but because she had practiced it that way, that's the way she performed it at the concert. So there was some, you know, jumping up and down for some parts and rearranging the fingering. And it was a really interesting project to do. So there's lots of ways 
you can do duets as well. You can also take some extra time to do more singing. A lot of teachers don't find the time to fit in singing, but I love singing in lessons with students. I'm a big advocate for it because it makes such a difference to their overall musical development just in so many different ways. And you could sing pieces that they're going to be playing after their hand is healed, right? So you could sing as a preview some of these pieces. You don't even need to tell them what the, what you're doing. You can if you want. But you could just practice singing along with the track, along with you playing it, um, using sulfur to sing, making up your own lyrics. And then they're so much more familiar with that music when they do get to play it, when they have both hands in full commission, right? You could also take more time for movement. So assuming they're allowed to move around a bit, if they've just hurt a wrist or a hand or something, they're usually okay to move around. Um, so we can do some movement. Again, you could use this to preview pieces that they're gonna learn in the future, right? So once their hands are better, they're going to be learning these pieces. You know that's the plan already. So you put on the tracks or you play it and you move together marching in time with the music, coming up with different actions to emphasize different things in the music. And finally, you could learn some things by ear. So you could ask them for their favorite artist or favorite songs, favorite video games, whatever references you need, favorite films, and then look up some of that music. I like to look it up on Spotify personally because then I can see the little E beside it if it's explicit and avoid playing that version. Whereas on YouTube that's not as clear and YouTube Kids is kind of too restricted, right? So I prefer Spotify for this. So look up one of the songs that they've talked about, listen together, see if there's some parts you can figure out together by ear. A lot of students, me included as a student, won't really do this at home because they almost need the permission from us and they need us to validate the fact that it is slow and that sometimes we're just hunting and pecking for the notes. We get faster at it, we have better instincts over time, but basically we're going to have to hunt and peck a bit. And so having us beside them to support them in that could actually take off for them. It could be Actually, they love playing by ear and they discover this new way of playing, new way of figuring things out that they can use forever. So answers, your suggestions are very welcome. Please add them into the chat. But I'm going to run through my review, my um, list of suggestions just quickly. And then we'll do an ask me anything section. So if you do have random questions, please ask them now. Just start with the word question and I can answer in a moment. But for our quick review, rapid fire review, you could play one handed music. Great source for this is pianopronto.com. You could improvise together. You could do extra music game time to work on theory. You could do an arranging project together. You could compose using one of our projects or some other source. You could do some extra theory workbook time, just a little bit. You could do some duets together. You could do some singing, perhaps to preview future pieces. The same for movement, you could use that to preview f future pieces. And you could work on learning things by ear. Quick extra note about the movement. I'm actually working on this at the moment. Some of these, so this is a, a sneak peek. <laughs> I haven't talked about it anywhere. It's in early stages, but I have this project I'm working on for Vibrant Music Teaching. Um, which will include movement actions to do with some of the most popular pieces. So, for example, one of the ones I'm working on at the moment is the Bergmüller arabesque, right? And we're doing these actions that emphasize the shape of the melody. So that's going to be a great example of this. And if your student, you know, goes on to learn that in the future, they're going to be so much more familiar with it. I often talk to my students about this because they need a lot of encouragement to listen to music at home. But I keep telling them, hey, remember that time that you learned Ode to Joy 
or any other piece that they learned quickly that they knew before they learned it. Why was that so easy to learn? And they might say, because it's a great tune. I just liked it. I'll say, it's because you already knew how it was supposed to sound. If you listen to your pieces enough, you will know how they're supposed to sound and it will be easier to learn them. That point needs drilling home again and again and again, doesn't it? <laughs> Let me know if you've had that experience. We're going to go into our Ask Me Anything section now. So any random questions or about this topic, let me know. I am just checking back in with the chat. Serena said, I use it as an opportunity to explore left-handed repertoire with students. I generally play more theory games and create rhythm maps with my younger students if they can write with their working hand. Great suggestions there. Um, Serena also shared that she's fractured her wrist when rollerblading. My teacher said I wouldn't be able to sit my exam, but went home, practiced the left hand of all my pieces every day and managed to pull everything together in time. That's so funny. Has anyone had parents think that their their child can't do their lessons at all? I've had that many times and I have to assure them, hey, there's loads of other stuff we can do. Just send them on over. Because a lot of their activities do have to stop. You know, if they're playing a sport where they could get more injured, they're not gonna be able to play that with a broken arm, but they can still come to piano lessons and keep that part of their routine. Yes, yes, yes to lots of salsa singing and favorite songs. Also work on rhythm. Fantastic. And Ashley commented on the piano for students of other instruments. Piano does help theory a lot. It was something, it was definitely something that was apparent in college theory and analysis. Yeah, for sure. It just makes things clearer because it's, as I say, all laid out. That's why Right, that famous quote, the piano is the easiest instrument to play in the beginning and the hardest to master in the end. That's kind of why it's easier to play in the beginning because you can see what you're doing. They're all there. You don't have to find them <laughs> like you do on other instruments sometimes. Yeah, composing is a great thing to do. Absolutely, Rachel. Um... Fantastic suggestions coming in. And Helen said, Rhythm Railroad could work well. Yes, with one hand for sure, just tapping a drum. Other percussion instrument, definitely focusing on rhythm is a great thing to do as well. So if there are no random questions, we're nearly out of time anyway. Um, but yeah, this has been a great discussion about what to do when your student injures one of their hands. And I hope you can refer back to it many times to not despair when this happens to you. Sometimes it is frustrating if you had upcoming plans for them, like a concert or an exam or something like that, and it's going to derail it. But you can see it as an opportunity to do loads of stuff that you normally run out of time for because you're so focused on repertoire that gets harder and harder and harder, right? Okay, we're going to wrap it up there, folks. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion and I hope to see you back here in two weeks. Next week is the practice symposium. So that is at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash PS. You can sign up for that and I'll see you there. Otherwise, I'll be back here on the live show in two weeks in the same time and same place. I'll see you then.